Hello everyone. Um, for today's video, I want to talk about another really popular misconception I see. Although, of course, there is some debate that this is just sort of the natural evolution of belief. I'm going to leave that up to everyone watching the video to decide. Um, but I want to present sort of the, the older traditional belief and how it evolved into where the modern belief is today. I well, apologize now, I do have a bit of a head cold, so I might <clears throat> be coughing and clearing my throat a bit. I know I sound a bit nasally, but I wanted to get this video done today for everyone um, anyway. So, uh, I'm kind of calling this one Fairies, Nature Spirits, Land Spirits, and the Fern Gully Problem. Now, mind you, I really like the movie Fern Gully, um, particularly the bat character. It's super fun. It's a really fun movie. Uh, it's really entertaining. It's a little bit dated at this point with the animation and everything, but I sort of use that as an example of the problem, if you will, of uh, the modern perception of fairies, because it really typifies the way that particularly middle class, um, and at this point sort of everyone, but middle class is where this idea came from, American culture uh, views who and what fairies are. And sort of from there, it is spreading really rapidly thanks to uh, mass media and just the way culture works at this point. Everywhere. Um, really everywhere. It's like a plague. I'm sorry. That's, that is showing a little bit of my bias on the subject, but there we go. So... The reason I call it the Fern Gully problem is going to become more clear as we get into this, but I'm picking that as an example because it really does sort of give us the, the classic modern view, um, particularly over the last 40 years, um, of how people perceive fairies. Uh, they're viewed as tiny. Um, sometimes to the point of being like insect-like tiny, uh, winged. Uh, they're often depicted in very rough clothes. Um, the clothes are not, it's not unusual to see them made out of uh, leaves or, you know, wild materials. Um, the fairies themselves have a sort of savage wildness to them, um, almost animalistic in some cases. Uh, artwork often depicts them that way. Uh, and they're seen as being uh, literally spirits of nature and very protective of nature. In the movie Fern Gully, um, and I'm not picking on Fern Gully, once again, love the movie, um, but I use it as an example particularly because the main theme of that movie is the fairies um, fighting against environmental destruction and particularly the sort of environmental destruction that destroys nature in favor of industry. And that is important um, for the modern view of fairies and how people now perceive them. So that all said, when we look at this whole subject, it is a very complicated one. Uh, which is why uh, this initially was going to be a much broader video, and I, I kind of broke it down into topics. Um, so my last video was originally going to be kind of rolled into this one, and I decided it would be too much to try to do all at once. Um, this is sort of a whole topic in and of itself. And I think we have to sort of start unraveling this with differentiating between what fairies are, what nature spirits are, and what land spirits are. Because part of the problem from a modern um, pop culture American perspective, uh, and from there spreading everywhere else, is that all three of these groups are sort of seen as just one big homogenous group. And that is problematic. Uh, when we look at the older material, the older traditional beliefs, the historic material, the folklore, even the mythology, 
we kind of clearly see that although there's always been very blurry lines between these three sort of classifications, there always were separate classifications. Um, and again, this is why I say it's a complicated subject. As with anything, when we're discussing the good neighbors, there really isn't any single, clear, straightforward answer. You just sort of have to accept with this subject that that is how this subject works. Uh, and that's not uncommon in my experience with folklore in general. Uh, there's rarely very easily delineated uh, categories that don't sort of blur into each other one way or another. When we talk about what fairies are, and we look at the older mythology, the folklore, the more modern anecdotal material, the cultures that still have the traditional beliefs, what we see is that the, the fair folk, the, the good people, the fairies, it really is a sort of catch-all term. And this got touched on in the earlier video on the definition of the word fairy. When the word first came into use, it was just a word used to describe any being that came from the world of fairy, any otherworldly being. And we still see that uh, in a lot of the way that it is used, not in America. Um, so you'll see references to fairies in Irish material, in Scottish material, in Welsh material, uh, in material from Brittany, which is a part of um, northwestern France, in Cornwall, in the Isle of Man, um, in uh, Norse material. Uh, they don't call them fairies per se, but the beings that we would uh, view in that sense, otherworldly beings. The Hulda folk, uh, Alfar, uh, would be the, the some of the terms in Icelandic, anyway. Um, when we look at the Orkneys uh, and those areas, I'm just picking a few off the top of my head. Uh, what would fall sort of under the auspices of the, the wider term fairy are going to range very broadly. Um, everything from uh, stereotypical giants to uh, very human appearing beings that are not human, that are otherworldly, um, to beings that are tiny, sometimes as small as ants, uh, without wings, by the way. Um, the wings are a very modern sort of thing that's, that's come about. Um, to animals. Um, we have fairy hounds, we have fairy cats, we have fairy horses. Um, fairy horses are actually a whole category in themselves. You have uh, literal horses of fairy that are just like mortal horses except a fairy and therefore more beautiful and faster and clearly superior because they're from fairy. And we also have fairies who can take the form of horses uh, Kelpies, uh, Ichukski, um, uh, Puka are sometimes said to be able to take the form of ponies. Um, in those cases, they look like horses or ponies, but they can also take other forms. They're shapeshifters. And, um, there's really just like, so I could keep going because of course the, the types of fairy beings out there are almost limitless. My point in emphasizing all of this is that it's an almost limitless sort of category. In this sense, the word fairy uh, almost becomes like the word animal. Uh, you can apply it to such a broad range of beings that it is useful in discussing these beings and discussing the world of fairy um, and discussing the folklore and the stories, but it also is limited. And then it doesn't in and of itself give you um, a lot of very specific information. You have to go from that into something more detailed. Um, and you'll often see in the stories that they're not talking about a fairy or fairies generally, unless the person who had the encounter wasn't exactly sure what they were encountering. And then they use the general term. Um, but they'll often go into a specific um, 
I, I had an encounter with a Gankanak. Uh, well, that's a bad example. People that have those encounters don't usually come out of it very well. But um, I had an encounter with, you know, whatever specific type of fairy. And this is the story that ensued. When people don't use this specific and they just use the general fairy, it's because they don't know the specific kind. Um, it's sort of like if you go outside at night and you hear rustling in the leaves, you might say, well, I heard an animal because you don't know what kind of animal it was, as opposed to, um, I heard a deer in the leaves. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, cause like I said, this is a very complicated topic. I just want to make sure I'm being as clear as possible. Now that is fairies. We also have the category of nature spirits. Uh, a nature spirit is pretty straightforward. It is a spirit of nature. Yes, some fairies can be considered nature spirits, but all fairies are not nature spirits. A uh, nature spirit is usually defined as a spirit that either personifies a natural phenomena or um, natural location uh, in some way, or um, exemplifies it. So you might have uh, a nature spirit who um, represents uh, a weather feature or a particular area of land. Now where this gets tricky is that land spirits um, are the um, spirit uh, or soul of a particular place um, or natural item. And there is a lot of confusion and blurring between nature spirits and land spirits. I personally think some of this is just a linguistic thing. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, the idea of uh, land spirits comes mostly from the Norse. Uh, it's As far as I know, it's a Norse word, um, landvatir, land white, um, land spirit, land being. And that in that case, it's literally... Um, a being who can appear that is the um, soul of a particular thing, whether it's this rock or this tree or this stream um, or this swamp. Uh, the island of Iceland has four particular um, very powerful land spirits that represent the island as a whole, for an example. Land spirits are generally nature spirits. Um, I'm not aware of any that aren't. Uh, we do also have uh, a concept in the Latin of a genus loci, um, which are uh, like spirits of place, spirits of location. They do seem very similar to land spirits, um, and those would also be uh, nature spirits, a type of nature spirit. So those two categories tend to have a lot of overlap. Um, the classic sort of Greek dryads, uh, or naiads, tree spirits and uh, water spirits, if I'm remembering that correctly, those would be nature spirits. They are the um, spirit of a particular natural object. There's a couple significant differences, though, between the majority of fairies and nature spirits and land spirits. A nature spirit or a land spirit, uh, as far as I know from folklore and um, what I've read, and also from personal experience, is um, bound to or connected to a specific location. If you have the spirit of a tree, it is the soul of that tree for all intents and purposes, um, or rock or stream. It really can't travel particularly far from that, um, sort of the way that we are, um, we have a soul, but we have this body. Um, and our soul can travel from the body, but it has its limits, um, or the body suffers or dies, which is problematic for us. Um, sort of the same thing for nature spirits. If the physical object is destroyed or dies, then the nature spirit loses its anchor in this world. And that is really a, a hallmark of what a, a land spirit or a nature spirit is, in my experience. 
and from what I've read. Um, they are strongly tied to a location. Um, the Lanfetir, the land spirits, can sometimes be tied to a very specific place, in which case it's not so much a, a set object as that wider location. Um, and then they, you see from that the longer lived ones. Whereas the spirit of a tree is only going to live as long as that tree, the spirit of a place can be very ancient. Um, the spirit of a mountain can be very ancient. The spirit of an island <coughs> excuse me, can be very ancient. So I don't want to give you the impression that all land and nature spirits are fairly short-lived in relative terms. Obviously, some trees can live for quite a long time. Um, but you can have land and nature spirits that can live for um, significant, significant spans of time. But they are always tied to a location. Um, we really don't see them moving or traveling. Um, in the rare cases, um, particularly where we see those that are tied to stone, where the stone is moved and the spirit moves with the stone. But again, they're bound to that physical um, object, if you will. Again, I hope that all makes sense. The difference here with land spirits and fairies, fairies are not bound that way to physical locations. They can and often are associated with physical locations. In fact, there's a huge amount of folklore about fairies um, of all sorts of different kinds in Ireland and Iceland and Scotland, all over the place, who are known to live in a specific place. Um, so that's very well established. Um, even in North America, we have uh, native spirits here um, that are known to live in certain locations. I tend to classify those under that very wide umbrella term of fairies um, because they are, in my experience and in my understanding of them, otherworldly beings. Um, they obviously are not called fairies. They have their own uh, names. Every different tribe is going to have different names and concepts for these beings. Um, the ones closest to where I live are called the Makiawisa, um, and they would require a whole other video to explain that. Um, the ones uh, that I, I learned about from my father and my grandmother, um, you have the Yunwit Sundi and you have the Nenehe. Um I don't find those around this particular area, those are somewhere else. But those are just some examples of different tribes and how they understand the spirits that are here. Um, from what I know, though, those are not land spirits. Um, when tribes would move, um, the, the spirits would, I don't want to say move with them, but they would find the same spirits wherever they went, if that makes sense. So there's no indication that those um, spirits that are native to America uh, are tied to places in that way, although we obviously do have nature and land spirits here as well, because nature and land spirits are everywhere, all over the place, all over the earth, everywhere. Um, and I'm not even getting into the whole animus, there's spirits of things everywhere anyway. But when we look at fairies, even though they have associations with specific locations, we also know that they travel. Um, we have a lot of folklore and a lot of anecdotes about fairies moving, um, sometimes between specific known locations. We have stories of them uh, being driven out of different spaces and then going and setting up house, so to speak, in a new location. Um, there's a ton of folklore relating to this. So we know that fairies are not sedentary. They don't just associate with one particular location, and if something happens to that location, then they're done and they're gone. Um, we also know uh, from anecdotal material that when populations would shift, when particularly the um, Irish and Scottish diaspora uh, moved to Canada and America, and from what I've heard, Australia, that the different um, types of um, cultural fairies associated with them would follow them, at least some types. We do have stories relating to that. 
which again just indicates that they're not tied to specific locations. They are able to move and relocate um, as they desire or need to. And that is a big difference between um, a land spirit and a nature spirit and the broader category of fairies. Although again, there is crossover and blurring between the groups. Why did I just spend so much time on that? Because it is very common in modern culture, modern American culture particularly, to view all fairies as nature spirits. There's reasons for this, which I'm going to get into, although I realize this video is getting long. I warned you this was complicated <laughs> before I started today. Um, but when we sort of pigeonhole them all into nature spirits, we are losing a lot of the nuances of the older folklore and the older beliefs and the modern ones that still exist in a lot of the traditional cultures. Um, we had this sort of disconnect that happened um, generally in the 18th and 19th centuries. And we ended up with these sort of two streams of belief going on where we have the older traditional um, folk beliefs, but then we had this new stream of belief coming up, which was influenced a lot more by romanticism and fiction than by actual day-to-day -day belief. Uh, and that, I think, is problematic. Um, actually, I know it's problematic. <laughs> That's not why I'm saying I think I know it's problematic. Um, and it's caused this situation in particularly modern American culture where we now have this very different understanding of what fairies are. So I think it's important to clarify the difference between fairies and nature spirits and land spirits right at the get-go before we get into the rest of this. Um, so we have to kind of go back to the Victorians. And I know I rant about the Victorians on a regular basis, but they deserve to be ranted about. The Victorians are sort of the time period where we see the concept of the middle class for the first time. Before the Victorians, before the Industrial Revolution, um, we're talking basically the 19th century for all intents and purposes here. Um, before this time, you really only had an upper class and then a lower class. So you had wealthy people and you had poor people, to be blunt. And wealthy people, for the most part, um, they had their hobbies and their interests, but they weren't super concerned with um, the beliefs of people who weren't them, to put it mildly. We do see some um, development in the 18th century of interest in um, anthropology and folklore as a hobby of the wealthy. Also problematic. <laughs> but... Um, it wasn't a, a huge thing, um, really up until the 19th century. And it was more when we start to see this concept of the middle class. And the majority of people in the middle class, as this new strata, were people who suddenly found they had free time. And time to indulge in hobbies, time to have parties, time to mess up a lot of stuff, which they did. So when the Victorians, the Victorian time period culture came along, we see particularly a lot of emphasis on an interest in stories and books and artwork that we didn't see previously. And one of the things that they were interested in out of the many um, Victorians, you really should look into them, fascinating cultural time period, uh, was this interest in fairies and fairy lore. But the Victorians in general tended to alter the things that they put out. So they had a very romantic view of fairies. They didn't see them as really dangerous. Um, they took the folklore and the stories and what we see being put out is children's books. 
Um, and the children's books, even though by our modern standards, they would have been um, sort of scary and inappropriate because our modern standards are very tame comparatively. Um, compared to what the original actual folklore was, it was very watered down um, and very tame. And we see an emphasis on the idea of fairies being tiny little winged children, effectively. Um, and we see a proliferation of artwork during this period that emphasizes this view of fairies um, and also of elves. And we've also already kind of touched on the whole fairies and elves thing basically the same beings by different names. But at this point, we start to see an emphasis of fairies being female and tiny and winged, and elves being male and tiny and not winged, which is still a problem that sort of plagues us today, but probably also a different video topic. And what comes in from that, now that we've established the tiny little winged fairies, is in the early 20th century, we see an artist called Cicely Marie Barker. And um, this would have been around the 1920s, I believe. She um, had a huge amount of very popular artwork that emphasized um, flower fairies. She has a whole series of books about flower fairies. And these are um, very young children. They look to be between like six and 10, um, dressed in whatever flower they represent with wings. Um, it, it is beautiful artwork, but it really reinforced this cultural idea of fairies, not only as little winged children, but this burgeoning idea of fairies as nature spirits, that they were very connected to nature. And this is something we see, this is the late Victorian period and going into the early 20th century, the idea that fairies are spirits of nature, that as opposed to being this a more accurate, older, traditional view of fairies as these autonomous, powerful, sort of demigod, dangerous beings that needed to be dealt with carefully and appeased and um, respected, feared. Um, now, they um, live at the bottom of your garden, and they're very twee, uh, and they're tiny little children, uh, and are cute, and yeah. Um, clearly a very different understanding of fairies than we see elsewhere. And this is particularly something we find in the middle class Victorian uh, cultural milieu, if you will. We see it in artwork, we see it in stories, uh, and it, it's something that sort of develops and grows during this period. It's also a time period where there was a lot of romanticizing of nature in general. Um, I personally think, uh, and this is my opinion, that some of this grows out of the disconnect that came with the Industrial Revolution between that middle class and the need to directly interact with nature uh, in any substantive way. So now you have people who don't necessarily have their own farm animals anymore, who don't hunt um, for food, they maybe only hunt or fish for sport now, um, who are not really living off of nature anymore. Um, and this disconnect from nature, who, who, you know, to quote Red and Tooth and Claw, creates this idea of nature in this more romanticized sense of um, a mother, mother nature, and gentle nature, and animals being personified in um, soft, friendly ways, uh, which you really didn't see previous to that, because um, wild animals are wild and will hurt you, um, even prey animals, because they don't want to get eaten. Um, and so this sort of gets wrapped into the idea of fairies as nature spirits, the idea that nature loves us, and nature is friendly, and nature wants to help us, no, I can't even say it with a straight face. But this is what we see happening. This combination of the romanticizing of the natural world and the idea that fairies are nature spirits sort of gnashes together 
and gives us this combined idea during the 20th century that fairies are nature spirits who are also kind and gentle and loving. And this is a problem. Um, This then goes on as the 20th century rolls forward into the idea um, as we start to become more environmentally aware, as we start to see later in the 20th century the idea of environmental awareness, that we need to be concerned about our environment because humans are wrecking it, which is true. Uh, the idea that, of course, fairies, as these twee nature spirits who love nature and care about us, are going to be super concerned and protective of the natural environment and are also going to be trying to help us to be more concerned and aware of the natural environment as well. This is really at odds. At this point, we've, we've really strongly diverged from where the older folklore uh, view lies. Even 200 years ago, uh, even not even 200 years ago, less than 200 years ago, you can find artwork of the smaller kind of t- beginnings of the Twee fairies um, hunting mice and hunting moths. Um, some of them are, are fairly entertaining in a macabre kind of way. Um, these little insect-like fairies, like hunting down actual insects um, with little spears and arrows and things. Um, the idea of fairies as protectors of nature and not um, as parts of nature who are also predators and potentially prey, but mostly predators, uh, is very different from what we find in the older folklore. When we really look um, in the older folklore, and again, when I say older folklore, keep in mind that these beliefs are alive and living in many modern cultures that just aren't middle-class America, and in some cases, um, middle-class other places. Um, I'm just emphasizing middle-class America because I don't want to speak too much for places that aren't where I live. Um, When we look at The living cultures that still have these beliefs, they still have these beliefs that I'm talking about. These are not like fossilized from 200 years ago and now everyone believes something different. Um, The majority, I think, actually still have the older beliefs. We're just so immersed in the modern pop cultural views that we think that's what everyone believes and that's not exactly true. Anyway. The older belief, um, you know, fairies do not have a particular interest in helping humanity at large. Many fairies are predatory towards humans. Uh, They use this as a food source. Uh, They use this as a resource in other ways that are not particularly beneficial to us. Um, They were never particularly environmentally concerned, although they are very protective of their specific places. So if the fairies... um, were associated with a particular location, they are known to be um, violently protective of it. Uh, There are many stories up until today, and I mean that literally, do a Google search, Iceland and Ireland both, um, and you will find stories up to within the last 10 years of this, where um, a road was going to be built that would involve tearing down a fairy tree or in Iceland moving a fairy church, uh, an elf church, Um, which is a a large rock where the elves are supposed to live. And um, the equipment breaks, people are injured. Um, Sometimes it said people would die. Uh, There was a case in Ireland, I've read the newspaper clipping about it, where um, telephone poles were put up too close to a fairy hill and the poles kept falling down. Um, They couldn't get them to stay up. So they, they are and will protect um, their own locations, their own particular places. However, there's never been any indication in anecdotal material or folklore that they are protective of our earthly world in a more general sense. Um, In the same way, there are uh, stories and cases where they will take an interest in a specific person, a specific human being, (coughs) and um, teach that person Uh, help that person in various ways, 
that does happen. But in the traditional material, there's nothing to indicate they are really concerned about humanity at large. Um, there's never been accounts of them um, really relaying any messages or acting in a way that would protect like an entire human community, never mind like humanity in general. Uh, so that idea is very foreign to, to the older folklore. I do realize there are some uh, modern authors and um, very well-known modern pagans who do receive messages, um, channeled messages, personal gnosis, uh, from beings that they consider to be fairies, fairy guides, uh, saying everything that I'm contradicting right now. I'm not speaking directly to that. Um, you'd have to ask them or talk to them. Um, I obviously do not know uh, what messages they're getting or from what or from who. There's a ton of different kinds of spirits out there. Um, what I would call a fairy, someone else might not. What someone else would call a fairy, I might not. So I don't know who or what they're talking to or what exact message they're getting or why. I can only speak to my personal experience and the bulk of the folklore and anecdotal material and what I know from talking with people um, in modern living cultures that still have these beliefs. So, you know, take that as you will. But what we know from all of that is that they, they really don't seem super concerned with our world at large. And I'm speaking here specifically of fairies. Keep in mind that fairies as otherworldly beings can always return to the other world. It gets a little complicated, as I mentioned in my last video, because there is a symbiotic relationship between humans and fairies. Um, if we manage to completely annihilate ourselves, that would most likely be problematic for them because they do need us in some sense. Um, so there could be some enlightened self-interest uh, for them and not letting us completely destroy ourselves. I don't know. <coughs> but either way, um, they always have a plan B that they can go fall back on if we manage to completely screw things up here. Um, nature spirits are a different story. Nature spirits and land spirits only have this world. Nature spirits and land spirits could very likely be advocating if they are aware of the wider issues going on or even just in their particular locations uh, for humans to um, stop being so short-sighted and to work to fix um, some of the things that are going on. I'm a little skeptical that nature spirits would understand what global warming is as a concept um, or climate change as a concept, but that's just me being cynical. Maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, but certainly the idea of not dumping garbage in water, um, not ruining the environment, not killing, uh, things that don't need to be killed, uh, for sustenance, those are messages that would be in line with nature and land spirits, um, and their relation to the rest of the, the spirits in the world around them for what that's worth. Um, cause there, again, there is that difference between fairies as a group and nature and land spirits. And they, they do have somewhat different interests when it comes to the human world and human interaction. Not all nature and land spirits like humans, however. Um, also keep that in mind. Um, quite a few of them that I've encountered, uh, are not fans of humanity because of the way humanity has messed a lot of stuff up. Uh, and because of the scale some of them operate on, they're not particularly good all the time at differentiating humans from each other. Um, humans are just sort of all humans. Um, kind of like us with squirrels. Uh, we can't really tell one squirrel from another. Uh, they can sometimes be like that with us. We're all just sort of equally annoying and problematic to them. So, to kind of wrap this up, and why I call this the Fern Gully problem, is that when we watch a movie like Fern Gully, 
um, or some of the other ones that have been made since. I realize, again, Ferngully's getting a bit dated at this point. Um, the idea that fairies are these tiny little, um, all of them are nature spirits, echo warriors, um, super interested in protecting the environment and in helping humans to learn to be better humans and better in tune with the environment. I'm not saying there aren't a, a small percentage of, um, beings that would fall under that umbrella term of fairies who might be like that. But I would advise a lot of caution in um, deciding that all fairies are like that. At best, you're talking about a fractional amount of a huge group. Uh, the vast majority of them are very foreign to that particular viewpoint. Um, they're not Tinkerbell. They're not the fairies from Ferngully. Um, they're just not that. Um, and most of them are not super concerned with human interests. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Um, I call it a problem because I do think it is a problem. I think that particularly for people who are interested in the subject of fairies and interested in, um, in any way connecting to this world or these beings, you have to understand how limiting that um, fern gully view is and that you really are um, looking at a much wider, um, broader, richer uh, world and group of beings than that tiny little, little concept. Um, so I guess that's my food for thought that I'm going to end this video with. Uh, if fairies interest you, by all means, if you're very into the idea of garden fairies um, or ecological warrior fairies, I'm not saying don't um, have an interest in that or try to connect to that, but just be aware um, that there are so much more, um, there's so many more out there than just those, and that you really can't... Um, you really can't open the door a little bit and not run the chance that you're going to encounter other things than just what you intend. As much as we like to think that humans have this total control over everything, um, that's just hubris. We don't. And once you start to connect to um, spiritual things or otherworldly things, um, much like if you go out and take a walk in the woods, Maybe you're doing it because you want to go bird watching and see birds. That doesn't mean you're not going to encounter rabbits or squirrels or a skunk or a mountain lion. We just don't know. Um, there is an aspect of uncertainty. And I guess my entire point with this video is no matter how much you like birds, you need to be prepared for the mountain lions too. So no matter how much you like the idea of the, the twee little helpful environmental warrior fairies. Be prepared that there are other things in the world of fairy um, and that not all of them are friendly and not all of them are helpful and some of them may try to eat you. So, and that's not hyperbole. I, I do mean that literally. Just some thoughts to keep in mind. I'm not trying to end this video on a down note. I know I've gone way long at this point, um, but I knew it was going to be a long video. I'm glad I split this up or this would have been a lot longer. And I will come back uh, and do more videos as long as people keep liking them. Um, but hopefully that's offered some clarity on the difference between fairies and nature spirits and land spirits and how we got to where we are today, where they all kind of got muddled together. Um, I also do blame a little bit of uh, spiritualism in the New Age for adding in that aspect that they're all just our friendly, helpful guide spirits. Um, I just don't want to rant too much about that. But we will um, look next time at uh, some other concepts relating to fairies. I will try not to be as much of a downer as this video was. But I do hope that this was educational and that people did learn some things about the more traditional views of fairies and about how we ended up 
at this sort of um, weird modern view, which is very disconnected and mostly born out of fiction and poetry and artwork and a romanticization of nature. Um, nature will be perfectly happy to eat you as well. So keep that in mind. And I will see everyone next time. Have a great day.